If you are seeking happiness and acceptance but not finding it in the world, this podcast shows you how to change everything in your life, soul, mind, and body. You can change anything with God, your prayer life, fighting the spiritual battle, controlling your thoughts, and changing your body, becoming exactly who God created you to be, joyful, loving, peaceful, with a strong will and a healthy body. Each day on Reality Reflections with Kendra Von Esch, that's me, we will walk the journey together. I will be here to support and love you through the good times and the bad as I share the ups and downs of my life and help you fight the battles in yours. I love you all. Find something more with God, soul, mind, and body, and have a blessed and inspired day. Boy, oh boy, did God speak to me, and he is speaking to you too. You may not have the same concerns or the same things going on in your life as mine, but I guarantee you, he's talking to you in the readings. And we're going to talk about what it means to be poor in spirit. So for me, it's coming down to the wire, people. I've got to put my signature, the ink on the paper for the retreat home. And you know I have been battling my idolatry with money. It's my retirement fund. I'm kind of scared about it, but there's a bigger part of me that is excited about it and knows that this is God's will. So who am I to go do the scared thing, keep my money in the market, which is a stupid thing to do, by the way. I truly believe that the market is going to take a hit, especially this election year. So why don't I pull the money out and put it in this asset? (laughs) And not just an asset, but God's asset. Building something for people to come and heal, for people to come and find new friends, maybe 11 of their besties, to learn how to pray, to learn how to fight the spiritual battle, and to listen to healing speakers. Okay, let's go back to the readings because this is exactly what I heard God say. So the first readings, again, is the book of James. Love me some James. Chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. Beloved, come now, who you say. Today or tomorrow we shall go into such and such a town, spend a year there doing business, and make a profit. You have no idea what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a puff of smoke that appears briefly and then disappears. Instead, you should say, If the Lord wills it, we shall live to do this or that. But now you are boasting in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, it is a sin. Look at my life. I know the right thing to do. I have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed on this retreat home. Every single time I get the same answer. Yes. So if I know the right thing to do and God wills it and I don't do it, it is a sin. This pertains to your life. If you are not living a virtuous life, a holy life, if you're not praying and you know you should, but you do not do it, it is a sin. By the way, that is a sin because the first of the two greatest commandments is loving and worshiping thy only God with all your soul, your heart, your mind, your strength. And when you don't, and that's God's will for you, you are sinning. Same with any mortal sin. Same with not forgiving. God wills you to forgive and not be resentful. Even in the Bible, he says, I will not forgive you if you do not forgive. So while this was specifically talking about money and quote-unquote business, 
It pertains to anything that God wills, that God commands us to do. And then the responsorial psalm, blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And I want to read two verses. Why should I fear in evil days when my wicked ensnares ring me around? I'm telling you, that's the weirdest phrase. But basically it's saying, why should I fear in evil days when wicked ensnares me all around me? They trust in their wealth. The abundance of their riches is their boast. That's what I'm struggling with. It's a lot of money to turn into this retreat home. A lot. And then to decorate it, you know, and then to keep it up and all of that. But am I going to hold on to that fear because I don't trust God, especially if this is his will? I'm going to trust in my wealth. Okay. And then the last one, for he can see that wise men die. And likewise, the senseless and the stupid pass away, leaving to others their wealth. There's another phrase in the reading that we just read that I thought of this too. Back in the first reading, you have no idea what your life will be like tomorrow. And we just read here in the Psalms, and likewise, the senseless and the stupid pass away, leaving others their wealth. This slaps me in the face with my husband. I don't know what my life will be like tomorrow. I certainly didn't believe on January 27th that my husband would die, that I would be sitting here trying to figure out my life. Thank God I never got mad at the Lord and I turned toward him and Mary in a huge way. Our Lady of Sorrows devotion, which I'm telling you over these last few days, I have not prayed. I've got to get back on my prayer program. Yesterday, I only prayed two rosaries, not four. This reading is telling me, <laughs> you know, get on it because with something as big as what God is asking me to do, I need to be poor in spirit. I need to take every single day with God and trust in him. So I'm going to read a little bit from Catholic Answers, Father Sebastian Walsh. A little bit about, I was just going to change my subject. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? We all know what it means to be poor. A poor, list, bleh, a poor person lives day by day and does not have an abundance of possessions saved up for the future. Each day, a poor person needs to earn or receive the things he needs to survive for that day. His life and work are concerned with the, with the necessities, food, clothing, and shelter. He does not have time or money for vacations and pleasant diversions. If someone is particularly poor, he will sometimes even lack the necessities for a time. The life of a poor man is summed up well by the proverb in Sirach 31.4. By the way, if you have a non-Catholic Bible, some of the Protestant churches took out the book of Sirach. So you ought to go out there because it's beautiful and look up Sirach online. So this is Sirach 31 verse 4. The poor man toils as his livelihood diminishes. And when he rests, he becomes needy. So we know what the poor are, but who are the poor in spirit? Some poor in spirit is someone, sorry, someone poor in spirit is someone who lives in his spiritual life the way the poor man in his body lives his physical life. The physical poor man works each day to receive his bread. The spiritual poor man prays each day to receive spiritual nourishment from the Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. The physically poor man does not have time for unnecessary distractions. The spiritually poor man sees that he must always attend to the necessities of the spiritual life, prayer, works of mercy, confession of sins, and he does not give in to unnecessary distractions. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. Think about how many unnecessary distractions take you away from prayer. 
take you away from praying all day, every day, incessant prayer, as St. Paul says we must. Because if we are not praying a thankful prayer to God every hour, we are truly not poor in spirit. We are living on our own accord. We are living on our physical life. And maybe we're even idolizing our money. The physical poor man sometimes lacks even the necessary food for a time. The spiritually poor man will sometimes feel abandoned by God and have desolation in prayer. Yet, all the while, will continue trusting in his heavenly Father to provide for him. This is what I need to do, everyone. And I'm sure you need to do it in your life. You need to trust that if you continue to turn away from the world, turn away from your idolizing of money, turn away from your sin and your addiction, turn away from your resentment and judgment of others, that God will provide for you. He will heal you from those vices. Gosh, people, I am walking, living, breathing proof of that. How many things have he, has he healed me from? So everything. <laughs> and I'm not going to get into that now because I have more to read. Another possible meaning for the expression poor in spirit is that it names those who are detached from wealth because of their love for God. Someone can be detached from wealth for many reasons. He may be lazy or imprudent. He may be, a sub, he may be subject to a false ideology that says wealth itself is an evil. Do you hear that, people? Having money is not evil. We just heard it's a false ideology. And some people believe that money itself is evil. When you hear in the Bible that the root of all evil is money, it's because those are the people who worship money and will do anything for money. Destroy people, lie, cheat, steal, Okay, someone can be attached from wealth for many reasons. Okay, I did that. No, none of these exhibits special merit. But those who are detached from wealth because they are attached to God deserve some reward. Such people see money as merely a means to the end of loving God. They freely bestow from their goods upon the poor. They do not sin in order to acquire or keep wealth. Okay, I look at myself when I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to let go of my love of money and my fear that I won't have enough because I'm going to build this retreat home. But I am going to charge for the retreat home because I do have upkeep and maintenance and an operating cost. I don't know how much that will be, but I need to pray to God so that I am not greedy. You know what I'm saying? My time is valuable. We've heard in the Bible that we should get a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. So I don't feel bad in earning something for my time and my effort and my love and all of that. I charge to go speak. I charge for my books and soon my hats, which will be available online very soon. So I just don't want to sin in order to acquire or keep wealth. But even among those who are detached from wealth, there are two kinds. First, there are those who are not excessively attached to their wealth so that they rightly subordinate their desire for, the, for wealth to the love of God. Second, and more perfectly, there are those who love for God who's... Sorry, people, I'm having a problem reading today. Second, and more perfectly, there are those whose love for God is so great that they simply have no desire for wealth at all and even spurn it. Souls such as St. Francis of Assisi exemplify this more perfect poverty of spirit. This kind of poverty of spirit is clearly motivated by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm not St. Francis of Assisi, people. I'm pretty sure you're not either. And don't be feeling bad. Because this is the world we live in. You need money to get things. Unless, of course, you live in the middle of nowhere, you have a well, you've got some chickens, and you're growing your own stuff, and you have cows and all that kind of and pigs that you can slaughter yourself. You can pretty much live on your own without any money. 
But I digress. Look at all the Amish people. <laughs> They're doing a great job. In another sense, the poor in spirit can refer to those who are detached from worldly honors. That is, they are humble. And when their poverty of spirit is great, they even spurn worldly honor. As Queen Esther did, You know that I hate the glory of pagans, that I abhor the sign of grandeur which rests on my head when I appear in public. Abhor it like a polluted rag, and do not wear it in private. Finally, the expression poor in spirit can mean poor in the spirit. This does not mean that they have little or nothing of the Holy Spirit. Rather, it means that their poverty is motivated, motivated by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For such men, the gifts of the Holy Spirit incline them to seek their treasure in heaven. Quote, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Luke chapter 18, 22. In short, the poor in spirit are those who are humble, those who depend upon God completely for every good, bodily, and spiritual. All of these ways of understanding the expression poor in spirit have three qualities in common. One, they trust in God to provide for their needs. Two, they are detached from wealth or honor. And three, they all love God more than wealth or honor. Whoever has these qualities is an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. Sorry, I butchered that reading, oh, but I just don't have time to re-record this because that's what I would do is stop and re-record. But I can't today. I have to go to mass and then I am visiting my niece who had twins. She already has two girls, just had twin baby girls. I cannot wait to see her. And I have been pushing it off because I've been so busy. And that, my friends, is sometimes what God wants us to do, is to focus on the people around us. I really needed that spiritual retreat this last weekend. Because I think I've mentioned to you before, we've got some new listeners all the time, but I hadn't seen anyone for a couple of months, including my own kids and my own family, except the contractors down in Tennessee. Now that is not good. We are here to be with people. We need a community. And I don't care if these people in my life are or are not walking the journey with Jesus. I just need to be a good friend. I also need to fill myself with this friendship and this love and a different view. I always say that we need people that are like us on the journey so that we have someone that we can talk to. It can be a coach, by the way. I am a faith coach. If you want services, send me an email at Kendra at KendraVonAsh.com. We can talk all about what you're trying to change in your life. Maybe it's you cannot get a prayer life implemented because you're turning toward the world too much. We just heard that today. But we do need people that we can talk to, friends that we trust, people that are also trying to change their lives. But we also have a whole bunch of people in our family, in our community, and out and about in the world, wherever we are, who are not on the journey. And our job is to exhibit that beauty, that love, that acceptance by how we treat them, how we love them, even the person at the checkout counter at the grocery store. We cannot allow our mood to change how we interact with people in our lives that come into our way today. This is why if you wake up groggy, tired, crabby, grumpy, and you start your day with God, you can be grateful for the grumpiness and the tiredness, and you can give it to God. You can offer it up as a sacrifice. You can ask him to take it and to make it meritorious and you are going to do your best with his help to be love, to act gracefully, 
and to not come across to the world as a big, crabby, grumpy person. This is how every single day can be a beautiful day filled with grace. Because God is going to reward you. He's going to pour down grace into your life. We should be thankful when we wake up grumpy and crabby and we don't want to get out of bed. We should offer it to God and say, I unite this to you on the cross, Lord. Please make it for all of the souls in purgatory or save living souls. You could even ask for yourself. Lord, I offer this up to you on the cross. Please help me not be crabby. I have lots of meetings today and I want to show you through how I live today. Then every day can be a day of gratitude, can be a day filled with grace. That's why a daily prayer life is so important. Do you get up first thing in the morning and grab a crucifix and kiss it? Do you thank God for the night's sleep that you had? Or do you thank God for the lack of sleep that you had because he willed it? Thank you, Lord. I offer up my tiredness. I did not sleep well last night. I unite it to you on the cross. Please go save souls. Everything that ain't going right in our lives can be used for the better of the world, for the better of our family. Maybe you want to pray exactly for someone in your family. Lord, I give up my tiredness. I unite it to you on the cross. Please help my mother, my brother, my sister, my friend, whoever. Okay, let's pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Spirit, please come into our minds, our bodies, our souls, our spirit, so that we can shine your spirit through us to the world. Help us to detach from the worldly things, money, material goods, The culture that tells us that we need to do certain things in order to be happy, in order to relieve stress. Help us to identify these things in our lives. And then help us to give it to you and trust that you, because it's your will, will help us in this specific area, by healing us, by turning us away from the culture, the world, the goods that we have that are enticing us to put them in front of you, that entice us to think that those are what we need in our lives instead of you. We need you to light our souls on fire to trust you more. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief pour down into our hearts a massive, massive amount of zeal and faith so that we can be different. You have called us out of this world. Help remind us that people are watching. People are looking. And when you heal us, help us to glorify you to the world sharing what you have done for us. Now we will pray for all of the people that have gone before us off of this earth by name in purgatory. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In your trusting, holy, merciful, healing name, Jesus, we pray. 
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Sit with the readings. Are you poor in spirit? Do you take every day like the poor person who's physically poor, who doesn't know where they're going to get their food and their shelter? Do you look at your prayer life like that? Do you live your day talking to God all day long, thanking him even in the bad? Offering up every bad thing? so that God can turn it into good for you, for your family, for the world? This is how he asks us to live. Check your life, because you are not going to be virtuous and holy if you're not honest with yourself. This is why we do the daily exam, and at the end of the night, we should look Okay, how did I pray today? Did I, did I live a life of being poor in spirit? Did I believe that God was going to take care of everything? And did I offer up all of my quote-unquote negative things because God allowed it? Did I make it meritorious? Some days you might be like, wow, that was an awesome day. Other days, not so much. And that is what it's all about. People, it's like, this is how I used to be. If it wasn't 100%, then I'm done. Like I would start a new exercise program. I would start a new diet. And the minute I had that cookie or the minute I didn't do that workout, I would quit. Life is not perfection. Life is doing your best, and when you fall, getting your butt back up, run into confession if it's a reason to go, offering it to God, and then starting over. Even if it's a thousand times, you have to start over in the day. Gosh, what a different mindset I have with God, because I know I'm not perfect, but when I turn to Him, I feel love for myself. I don't beat myself up. I just try harder the next hour, the next day. That is the walk. So love yourself through it. Love everyone else through it. And most importantly, love God through it. All righty, everyone. I love you all so much. I have you all in my prayers. Please keep me in yours. And if you're not praying learn. If you need coaching, get some. Don't keep living your life in your own control, thinking that you can do this. The moment that you humble yourself and you give it up to God, he will pour grace into your life. Remember, he, he works with the humble, not the proud. Have a blessed and inspired day.